Good evening. Uh, my name is Stefan Harding. I'm an ecologist. Um, I have a doctorate in ecology from the University of Oxford in England. And I've worked for 15 years with Jim Lovelock on Gaia theory. And I'm visiting Lynn Margulis here at UMass. I've been talking to her students. And it's a pleasure to be here. Tonight I'm going to talk to you about Animate Earth, which is the title of a book I've just written. Um, and it has to do with the ecological crisis that we're going to be talking about and some possible resolutions. So uh, let's get started. You've probably all heard in the news and in the media that the Earth is in a very bad condition. And this is, in fact, the case. I've got some graphs here that illustrate what I'm talking about here. Um, here are graphs. Each of them go from 1750 to the year 2000, showing all sorts of things that are actually rather bad, but that are increasing exponentially fast. For example, uh, here we have um, the GDP, the human population, the use of fertilizers, the use of water, the use of paper. Uh, here is the one that's the real killer. Here is the one that's the index of planetary breakdown, the exponential increase of McDonald's restaurants around the world. Um, many other things, all going up exponentially fast. We have the next one, and you'll see there's even more. Here are greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, methane, very powerful greenhouse gases. Here's the surface temperature going up exponentially fast since about 1970. Uh, here's the loss of marine fisheries, uh, many others, uh, nitrogen going into the ocean, and finally the loss of global biodiversity. Very, very serious uh, losses and changes in the earth. And I just want you to contemplate these for a while, and get the feeling for how serious this is. Our world is really beginning to fall apart, and we are the cause of it. Now, part of the problem is our consumption of raw materials from the wild earth. And this picture illustrates this. Here is how many planets would be required uh, if everyone on the earth lived like the average US citizen. Basically, we would need 5.3 extra planets to provide all the raw materials for everyone to live at such a level of consumption. In the UK, we do a little bit better. We only need 3.1 planets. So you can see from this that clearly our consumption levels now are completely unsustainable because everyone on the planet is aspiring to consume like the average US citizen. Okay. So, the question is, <clears throat> how is it that our culture has become so destructive of nature? What is it about our culture that has led to this war on nature? Because in effect, this is what this is. No one's actually planned this war. It's not as if there are generals deciding on how best to destroy nature. But nevertheless, what we've seen, what those graphs have shown us, amounts to a war. And it was E.F. Schumacher, the founder of the college at which I work in uh, Dartington in Devon in England, Schumacher College, who said that Western man is waging a war on nature. Problem is that if he wins, he'll find himself on the losing side. We are about to become planetary losers big time. If these trends continue, um, major climate scientists are quite certain that our civilization is doomed. So we have to do something about this. Now, oh, one of the things we have to ask is, what is wrong with our worldview? Uh, what is it that drives our culture to be so utterly destructive? And the story is complex, and we haven't got time to go into it. But we can pick up the threads of this complex story about what went wrong with our culture, what went wrong with our worldview, with the scientific revolution in the 16th and 17th centuries. So if we look at some of the progenitors of the scientific revolution, such as Galileo, they were saying things like this. The book of the universe is written in the language of mathematics. Now, that doesn't sound too bad. But what, in fact, Galileo means by this is that we can rely only on what we can quantify, only on what can be measured. Anything that's to do with qualities, um, with values, with our ethical response to things, is irrelevant to science. The only thing that va is valuable is what can be measured. It's as if we have to extract the numbers from nature in order to gain reliable knowledge. We must suck the numbers out of nature, put those numbers into a mathematical model, which will allow us to predict and control the phenomenon in the future. And here we have um, Descartes, who told us that the whole Earth, and indeed the whole visible universe, is nothing more than a dead machine. It's not alive, it's dead. It's just mechanical stuff. 
no value in it at all, and that only the human has value because of our analytical reasoning, which gives us a peculiar connection to God. So um, when Descartes' followers cut open live dogs and they screamed in pain, he said to them, ignore the screams of the dog, they're merely the creakings of a machine. And uh, Bacon followed with this and said that we have to use this method it, to gain power and control over the universe. So you get the picture. The picture is we humans are in charge of nature. We are the only ones with any kind of consciousness or intrinsic value. The whole of the universe is, is a dead machine and we can use scientific reasoning um, and scientific analysis in order to gain dominion and control over nature for the benefit of humans. That's the picture. Now it's no surprise that if you run this picture for 400 years you get the vast ecological crisis and vast social crisis that we are now seeing in our time. So we have to do something about this. Now what can we do? Well we mustn't reject science, we have to go back to an earlier perspective that we find in our culture, a pre-scientific perspective. Look back in our culture to see if there's something there that we can rescue and bring back into modern times to heal our unbalanced approach in science. And indeed there is something like this in our culture. And it's summed up by these two words, anima mundi. This is Latin, it means soul of the world. And these two words actually come from the Greek and from Plato, uh, who talked about psyche cosmu, the psyche of the world. So the idea here, in, our, in the deep roots of our own culture, is that the world isn't a machine at all. It's not a machine. It's in fact more like a mind than it is a machine, more like a psyche. The idea is that everything is full of soul, everything is full of qualities, everything has intrinsic value. Ultimately, everything is sacred. Every single atom, every single electron is capable of experience. These are all subjects. So in the words of Father Thomas Berry, um, the world is not a collection of objects, it's a communion of subjects. So then the question is, can we use this perspective to rescue our science from its unbalanced emphasis on pure rationality? Many people around the world still hold this worldview. Traditional people from all over the world held, here are some of your own native North Americans, the first people, they all hold or held to this animistic perspective of the world. That everything is full of soul, everything is full of intelligence. That the world is indeed a great psyche, not a machine. Okay. Now, this brings us to Gaia. Gaia is the Greek divinity, the ancient Greek divinity of the earth. Um, for the ancient Greeks, the planet was sentient, was alive, full of soul, full of intrinsic value. Um, and in fact, Gaia, this earthly realm, is nothing other than anima mundi, the soul of the world, manifested uh, in, a, in a terrestrial form. So the question is, can we recover this ancient view of Gaia as an animate presence and reunite it with our scientific understanding? This is what I'd like to explore from now on. So this is Hesiod, 700 BC, writing about Gaia in a very animistic, soulful way. Gaia, of course, being the earth. Gaia the beautiful, he says, rose up, broad blossomed, she that is the steadfast base of all things. And fair Gaia first bore the starry heaven, equal to herself, to cover her on all sides and to be a home forever for the blessed gods. So if you listen to that discourse, you can get the feeling of how the Greeks sensed and saw the earth. Not as a machine, not as a dead thing, not as a set of resources to be exploited by us, but in fact as a living sentient being, full of beauty, full of intelligence, full of gifts for all living beings. Okay. It's my contention that as the ecological crisis has deepened and deepened and deepened, Anima Mundi, if you like, is trying to get through to us through what Jung called our four ways of knowing. And these are intuition, our sensory experience of the world, our ethical feelings about the world, and finally, our rationality, our thinking about the world.